All yeah. right, here we are. Dr. Goldberg and Eric Vickery again in September, our fireside chat this month. And we've both been, I think, uh, all over the place of late, uh, myself in Italy. And right before that, though, you were somewhere. Where were you? We were in Europe. Europe. We Where'd you Germany, um, Germany, Austria, uh, Slovakia, and then Hungary. Hungary. Wow. You were all over. So it's kind of like Southeastern Europe, right? Yeah. So we Central, went, South. Yeah. We, it was a, we went down the Danube. Wow. Okay. We just did Cinque Terre, which is Italian Riviera, five villages. We, we actually just kind of all over that Northwestern coast of Italy. I've never been to Europe before. It was a lot of fun. Ate my way through Italy and uh, the vacation in the water. It was amazing. The water, the weather was 81 to 84 degrees. It was perfect. So we absolutely loved it. Highly, highly recommend it. We could do a whole show on, on how to visit these places, right? <laughs> we, we, we could. Yeah. Um, You've got maybe. quite the, the travel. Your passport's all stamped up with all your Europe trips over, over the years, right? Yeah. Well, I had to give in my last one. I'm yeah. On, I'm on my third passport. I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. But, you know, there's, so there's value in... I was talking about this this morning. I think there's a lot of value in travel if you approach it the right way. So the value in travel is not seeing new places. The value in travel is experiencing other cultures, mm. um, learning about other people. And, you know, I know we're going to talk about transformation. Yeah. But you know, I think it starts with sort of self-analysis and Americans are, <laughs> how can we say, we have hubris, <laughs> right? We, we think that it's we the way, this is our the way. way is the best way. Yeah. Our way is the only way. And that the way we think everyone else should think mm -hmm. our values are, should be everybody's values. Yeah. And, and that's, and one of the nice things about travel is you realize that that's not the case there was just in the now look in the bigger cities i get it but the area we were i mean there was there was no trash on the ground like you go to these train stations and they're clean you know uh, there's graffiti on the sides of the trains but you know there's there's for for better or worse i'm not sure no no homelessness like in your face all over the place really um we we ended up buying some jewelry from this guy and he was asking what we did for a living. It was actually for a gift. And uh, I was trying to explain to him, you know, I had to Google translate some things. I'm like, what do I tell him? I, you know, I coach businesses. How do you, how do you do that? You know, I was like a small business coach and I was looking at it. It was like, we don't have that in Italy. <laughs> you know, we don't have that job. And then Abby being a counselor, she, we showed him, he's like, yeah, we don't have that. So, so nobody goes to counseling either, I guess. And so there's, I think there's some good and bad and you look at it, it's like nobody's suffering. Everybody's got family to take care of them. There's a place for everybody to be and um, people are brought in. And I think they're very proud of what they do. They're proud of their country. So, so that's, so the, wh why is, why is the place clean? Yeah. Right. So when you have pride, mm -hmm. your home, your home's not a pigsty. That's right. Not the part that you're going to show other people. Maybe. Yeah. No, your your bedroom might be, but you bring people into your home. It's probably pretty neat. Yeah. You have pride in it. Well, that's right. In a in a small town, people have pride in their in their in their village. Mm -hmm. uh, they and they understand the connectivity between people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if AA, that's one of the reasons they're friendlier. Well, and, and they don't exist without tourism. There is no economy in that place. I mean, they're catching sardines and making food and that's about it. There's some maybe some boating going on, but without the sales of their their home in country made products and 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 selling food and and being in the marketplace and all that, 
there's that, that those, there's no place to live there. Yeah. It doesn't exist. So I think they value the fact that, yeah, we got to put up with, you know, these Americans <laughs> to come through, but we, we made, um, and you're right. We were interested, not interesting. We were, we took a cooking class. We got to know this one restaurateur and this is a developed a relationship and went there a couple times and you kind of developed your favorite things. And learned some things. It was, it was it was truly amazing. And you come back transformed. You come our topic for today. You come back transformed, and you say, you know what? I have a. I need to look at things a little differently here, and the respect value and the pride value, and and what we're doing here, and how we're operating. I, obviously, I don't have control over everybody else's thoughts, but I noticed. I went golfing on Saturday, and it was a scramble. I noticed I was picking up trash on the golf course, throwing it away. I don't know that I normally do that, but I was, I, I don't know if it's subconscious or not, but now that I'm talking to you, I'm recognizing that was happening and maybe there's a correlation or not, but it was so clean. People were so friendly. They were so welcoming, so nice. They didn't care. I didn't speak Italian. They were so friendly about it. It's like, oh, another American who can't speak Italian. That wasn't it. You know, they were very welcoming in that. So I'm very proud to share what they do and how they operate. So I think there's a place for that in our businesses too. Well, there is. And you know, on Saturday, well, you were out golfing. <laughs> um, we were celebrating the Jewish New Year. Yes. Um, and I enjoy the the wisdom of some of the cultural aspects of Judaism. And um Since COVID, we've been having services um, with the family. Mm -hmm. So we have enough people. And my brother puts a tent in his backyard. And um, we do ser we do the whole service. That's awesome. Um, and between my brother and myself. Yeah. So, um, so I gave a sermon. Um on actually it was on sunday so the holidays two days i gave a sermon both days but the her sermon on saturday sunday was after reflecting and that's part of the value of the holiday is it's a time for reflection mm -hmm. um between now and then yom kippur 10 day nine days from now which is the day of atonement Mm -hmm. So now is the time when we want to encourage transformation. So we read portions of the Bible on these on holidays. And the portion of the Bible that we read on the new year is talks about the birth of Isaac to Abraham and Sarah. That's on day one. And on day two, the binding of Isaac. So on, I started on Mount. When you Mount say bind Mariah. Mariah, okay. Mariah. Okay. Arhamoria. Um, so I speak Hebrew, so I know I know the biblical stuff. Mm -hmm. Um and I was thinking about it. Why, why did we, why did the wise men choose that portion to talk, to, to just to read mm. on the holiday? And I, I think it's all about the ability to transform. And if you think about the stories of the Bible, and I love the Bible for its wisdom. Um, and it tells, I mean, the first book, Genesis, is replete with stories, um, allegories, if you would, that are supposed to impart some lesson. Mm -hmm. What's the lesson? So yeah. I, I, I believe some of, a lot of it, if you look, look at Abraham, be, went from a, from worshiping idols to monotheism. Um, 
if you look at um, Isaac went from a from sort of warring with his brother, um, sort of cheating him out of his um, inheritance um, to the 12 to sort of bearing the 12 tribes of Israel um, to Joseph, who was this uh, such an annoying kid that his brother sold him into slavery. <laughs> right. And then he becomes the vizier of the Pharaoh in Egypt. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are all, these are, they talk about transformations, right? Um, and there are a couple of things that they have in common. So um, the three I mentioned, Abraham changed, Abraham changed his name to Abraham. His wife, Sarah, Sarai, changed it to Sarah. Mm -hmm. um, Jacob became Israel. Mm -hmm. Joseph had his name changed when he was in Egypt to Zafnat Panea. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't even going to type it. So as soon as he starts, I was like, I'm not typing this one. <laughs> Uh, Z A P A. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. A T A. Um, <laughs> so, and Abraham had to move. He had to leave his home. God told him, "Go, leave." They had to leave their home. Change, so they changed their place. And then they changed who they were around to the point where Abraham or Sarah actually chased away Ishmael and Hagar because she didn't want them to be an influence on her son. Mm hmm. Hmm. Who do you want to be like? Right. I mean, what well, Jim Rohn, right? You are the average five. of the five people that you spend yep. the most time with. So, you know, name, location, and associates. Yeah. Demographics. <laughs> so, the, I mean, that's a formula. I feel like you're telling me I should move to Italy and change my name to Mario. I feel like that's what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I really did love the pizza. <laughs> but so, I, you know, I think about it. And I'm reflecting on this. And, you know, I probably mentioned parts of my story, but parts of my story was, um, and I've changed a lot, but after I after I had a failed partnership, I moved to a new office, surrounded myself with different people. I changed the name of the practice. So the practice then became Manhattan Dental Health. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, looking back at things, that actually is what helped transform what was a successful practice, but into a really successful oral systemically focused practice. And did you see when that failure occurred, did you see it as failure? Did you see it as, oh no, or were you like, okay, this is a really good thing? So I must admit, I saw it as failure. Mm. I saw it as failure and said, well, first of all, I saw it, I mean, it cost me $2 million. Mm. It was a $2 million swing. Mm. All right. I mean, I lost about a million dollars and then I had to Buy, spend. Create a new spot. Yeah. Yep. Right? So it was a $2 million swing there. Um, and that was painful. I, I felt failure in my leadership. So there was transformation 
there as well, because I realized that the failure of my partnership was as much a failure of me as anything else. Um, you know, maybe I chose the wrong business partners, but ultimately. But you learn, but you learn from that. And, and in the end, as it turns out, you're now, you're now Joseph saving everybody, <laughs> you know, you're on the other end of this going, okay, this is a, this actually was a great thing. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So it was that being out of that partnership and in this new transformative practice and lifestyle, actually, um, my network changed, you know, I got involved with, you know, the Academy for Oral Systemic Health. I got involved with, um, eventually with Michael Gelb and sleep, dental sleep medicine and TMJ. And I started, you know, speak, I, speaking more. Mm -hmm. I spoke while I was in that partnership. We spoke a lot about um, digital dentistry mm -hmm. because we were, we had a CAD CAM practice and we were um, key opinion leaders for Serona. Okay. Uh, so we spoke at their 20th and 25th anniversary. Um, anyway. Yeah. It, it was totally transform me. Yeah. Transform the practice. But in the moment you're Joseph in the pit going, wait a second, I'm in a failure position right now. And actually there's a plan. And if you have the right intentions of transforming the position you're in into something successful, I think we've all had that, that story arc. You do such a good job at writing, right? That story arc of, you know, way down the pit to, oh my gosh, I'm up here and I'm going to help save my people. You know, I'm going to help lead. And there's a transformation that happens out of that. But when you're down here, it's so hard to see through that fog, through those clouds of what's coming. You don't really know. You just know you need to move into transformation. So that's, that's the fourth ingredient. Mm. Faith. Yeah. Faith. Mm -hmm. Whether it's faith in the almighty or it's faith in yourself or it's faith, it's karma. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whatever it is. Yeah. It's going to work out, right? Things are not being done to me. Mm -hmm. They're being done for me. For me, yeah. How do you, so what's the advice? To, I know we're kind of getting more philosophical here, but what's the advice of the person who's always going, oh my gosh, I'm never going to get there. I hate dentistry. Um, it just, this thing is sucking me dry. I, I don't, maybe I wasn't cut out for this. I mean, what if, if you're, if you're, if you got your dental degree, and you're on the other side of the, the debt or whatever it is. And now you're thinking you chose the wrong career. What, what career should you have chosen? I don't understand that. Like, what do you say in response to those? I mean, especially if you're dealing with college age students and they're going, hmm, but I, I, I see it more on the other side. It's usually like some sort of post on a social media thing. Like I, I'm in so much debt and I chose the wrong thing and I don't know what I should do right now. And I've, I've talked one client off the cliff of that before and he's doing great now. Thank you. Thank goodness. But what do you say to that when, when someone says those sorts of things? So you you ask them why they went into this originally. Yeah. yeah. What's what's the origin story? Yeah. You chose this for a reason. What was it? Yeah. And and then you analyze that. I mean, and that's frankly, the reason that that problem is a little bit more common today than it was back in my day was because people are going into it for the wrong reasons. Mm. Right. So in back in my day, and I know this because I've interviewed thousands of dental students applying to schools. Mm -hmm. um, back in my day, the answer was, always was because I want to help people. Yeah. I want to help people. Somehow in the 90s, late 90s, things shifted. And it was no longer I want to help people. It's I want a great lifestyle. Yeah. It becomes lifestyle. It becomes, well, I saw my dentist and, you know, he great goes on great vacations. He has a nice house. He has a nice boat. And that's what I want to do. He doesn't have to work on weekends. Every, all my friends whose parents are doctors are miserable. Yep. I'm going into dentistry. Yeah. Wrong. I mean, 
th those are the people who, if they look, if I, I, I had this conversation last week with a client who has a revolving door yeah. in their, in their practice. Yeah. Um, and I said, what are you looking for? What, what's your, what's, what's, what are the most important things that you're looking for? And they're talking about, you know, skills and experience. And I'm like, no, mm -hmm. I don't think that's what works. Yeah. Every, everyone we are in, and I, 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 I just finished reading um, Unreasonable Hospitality. Hmm. You got to read it. <laughs> Over the top. Over the top. So what we're in the hospitality business. Yep. All right. If, if we're not in the hospital, I mean, if we're not in the hospitality business, then we're in the service business only. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in the service business, you can be commodified. Yeah. Then it's just comparing prices and who's going to get me in faster and cheaper. Right. And, yeah. Hospital, if you're in a hospitality business, you can't be commodified because you, you can't be compared to anybody else. So... You have the, 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 the core value that you have to have in that business, you have to have a genuine liking for people. people. Yep. I, I, people. Yeah. And I, don't, and I don't care what position it is. So I don't care if it's the biller who's sitting in a room in the back mm -hmm. away from everybody. If that person doesn't have a, a light, a, a, an, an affinity for liking people, they will they will get a, act, they'll get act annoyed that out with the team yeah they'll get annoyed they'll get frustrated they're they always won't interact people. with the team well yeah. This is, yeah. we're building a team you can't yeah. have anybody on the team that's not a people person yeah they don't belong on a team they belong that's the, that's what happens when you go from this is this was our experience when you flew from italy to switzerland or germany as soon as you flew across that line there all of a sudden the personality was totally different totally different interaction with people. Did you spend time in Switzerland? Very, very little. And then our other, other group that went with us, the other couple, they flew back through Germany and we were sharing stories like, oh my gosh, it's really the same. Very little customer service. They don't, it's almost like they didn't like people, <laughs> you know? Right. It was, it was, it was a commodity, right? Yeah. So the product, the, you know, in Switzerland and in Germany, there's attention to detail right? Mm -hmm. Not attention to people. That's right. If you look at the disc, it'd be the DC, the mostly the DC side. <laughs> yeah. Right. No, I, <laughs> yeah, no, I, no S I, I say it this way. We're in the tooth industry. Yes. But we're in the relationship business and the hospitality, you can't have hospitality without developing relationships. And so that person, your client you're talking about, were you teaching him, Hey, it's not about the skill. It's about the attitude. It's about the willingness to love people and want to be around people. I'm assuming that's what you told him. Right. So, so the question becomes, how do you transform a practice? You talk, you know, the, the big thing now is how do I reduce my dependence on insurance? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you can't do that <laughs> unless you transform your practice from a service practice to a hospitality practice. And how do you do that? Well, A, starts with people. So you have to have the right people on your team who are capable of giving that kind of hospitality. Mm -hmm. You have to define what that looks like. You have to tell the stories of what hospitality is like. Sometimes you change the name. So I'm not, you, you, you might want to change the name of the practice. And I've recommended that to some clients. But change the name of the title on your for your for your uh, yeah. team members. Yeah, like office manager instead. It's manager is a terrible name. Mm -hmm. right? Um. So that they have to reflect the people component of whatever it is that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Um. 
What are and some so titles that you're using? Like you shared one before about like where they answer the phone. <laughs> so I, I actually just did this for somebody and we came up. So the guy, the guy who I think, and I apologize, I don't remember the name of the guy mm -hmm. who wrote the book, um, mm -hmm. Simple Hospitality. Yeah. But he, he tells the story of a couple, a couple, must have been a group. All right. So like you and you and your friends in Italy. Um, but these people are having a gastronomic tour of New York. So they've been to all the great restaurants, Per Se, Le Bernardin, uh, Momofoku. And now they're in his restaurant, which is, is 11 Madison Park. Um, and he overhears the conversation that they've had great, gr amazing, amazing food. Except they really missed out on not having a New York hot dog. <laughs> and this was their last stop. So they're leaving after this. Yeah. He goes out of the restaurant, goes down to the corner to the hot dog stand, buys a $2 hot dog, takes it back to the, to the kitchen. Yeah. He had to convince the chef that he needs you know, this, this you know, three-star Michelin chef is now. Oh my gosh. Out. So he, he sections the hot dog into four things and he puts, you know, a swipe of, you know, <laughs> mustard and a swipe of ketchup, spice it up, a quinell of sauerkraut <clears throat> um, and relish. And then they serve it to them before they're having their the their next course, which is like some fancy musk, dry aged Muscovy duck in fancy sauces. And stuff. Reduction. Before that. <laughs> Here's the hot dog. So he tells us he had never, ever seen a reaction of any of his clients, any of his customers like that. Mm. It The hot dog, the fact that he heard a conversation, acted upon it, just made the experience unforgettable and priceless. Hmm. Yeah. I looked up the book, Unreasonable Hospitality, Will Guidara. Guidara. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I've heard about it several times from people. So it must like be good. Number one, it's like number one on the New York Times bestseller list, like a year. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I actually, I actually follow him on Instagram. Now that I see his face, I just didn't put two and two together. Yeah, ah. I, I do follow him on Instagram. and he, he doesn't post a lot, but he always challenges you with hospitality service stuff. Yeah. So, and, and I, look, I mean, I, that's something that it's funny because he went to, there's a, the School of Hospitality at Cornell. Mm -hmm. I swear he went. Mm. Uh, and I had a couple of patients who went there. Um, and one of whom, who was the chef for a, at the time, you know, very, very popular, well-known, you know, four-star restaurant. Um, and, um, and we talked about hospitality a lot. And this goes, this goes back to the eighties. Wow. Um, I re cause yeah, we had our 20th anniversary anniversary celebration at his restaurant it was mm. called um the quilted giraffe mm. uh, doesn't exist anymore it used to be in the sony building um and sony kicked them out to make it executive dining rooms so the quilted giraffe closed um but morgan was the chef and um the it was the first time and we had been to we're foodies <laughs> well, we like that. And I, 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 you know, I've read, I used to recommend Danny Meyer's book, Setting the Table to my clients. Um, as a, but, and then, so Will, whatever his last name is. Guidara. Guidara bought, and, and the chef of the place bought the restaurant from Danny Meyer's. Oh, okay. Um. I think in 2011 or something like that. 
Um, so it's sort of like he's take, ta but and and Eleven Madison Park wasn't voted the number one restaurant in the world when Danny Myers had it. It was when Will oh, Goddard. Right. So he 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 upped. Yeah. He upped he upped setting the table to unreasonable hospitality, wow. hmm. right? So yeah. now, now I think that's going to be my one of my favorite books to recommend to clients. Yeah. How does that translate into transforming your hospitality and dentistry? Like I see people just annoyed the phone even rings. They treat it like it's their alarm clock. You know, that's it's like a mental transformation going, well, you don't get annoyed when, when you're playing... Um, at the casino and you're pulling on the handle and the alarm goes off there, you know, that one you're screaming and yelling and hoopla, we need to treat the phone like it's a jackpot, you know, and that we're excited that it rings. That's huh. a transformation in attitude. That's a transformation in hospitality. Um, people it's walking in right as you end your day, right? And you're, you're thinking, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to go home and somebody walks in. And, and the, how I liken it too is, I mean, business owner versus employee. And I, I know this sometimes rubs people the wrong way. I'll just say it, you know, cause I experienced it when I went to owning my own business. I have no problem working 50 hours last week, sick. You can probably hear it. You know, I had no problem with that. That would have been an employee that was not at work rightfully. So um, I get to work virtually. So I'm not infecting anybody. I don't think through this thing. So, uh, you know, but there's a different attitude. It's saying I have no problem working 7 AM to 6 PM with no lunch you know, because I love what I do for my business. There's a transformation and attitude that has to happen first for it to show up in your actions. So we, you had asked me about names, titles. Mm, mm. So that's how I got on the story yeah, of yeah. and, and, the, and the hot dogs. So once he analyzed that, he got this reaction and you're like, oh my God, I want to duplicate that. Yeah. How can I give more of, of those customers. experiences yeah those experiences so he 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 actually created a position called dream weaver <laughs> and cue right. the music cue the music right away right. Yeah. You, you don't want to hear him sing it, it? <laughs> um but but that's the kind of title so you know whether or not it's you know patient concierge yeah or um what did I, I we just had an office i was just working with this morning patient experience coordinators right I mean, mm -hmm. of course they call them pecs now but yeah right but it, there should be a name tag mm -hmm. it, you know they should know that what they're yeah but everybody yeah that, the problem with that title is that that should be everybody's title it should be it's pretty broad so because that's all it's all hospitality is about the experience mm-hmm Right. Yeah, I had uh, one that said, "I will take your money." That was what mine said. I will take your money. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, so again, the 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 primary what what is it? The, um, what what is it? What do they call it on Star Trek? The prime directive. Right. <laughs> the prime directive is you better like people. Yeah. If you don't like people, you're not in the right business. Yeah. There's and accounting that, for that. There's some uh, manufacturing for that. There's other businesses you could be in. There's AI for that. Mm -hmm. All right. I mean, we're now, we now have a writer's strike mm -hmm. and an auto union strike because they're concerned about AI. Yep. Well, you know what? If you're not a people person, you should be concerned about AI too. <laughs> because AI, AI doesn't care about people. They just care about getting an answer or a result. You know, that's the Swiss German way of doing it. <laughs> yeah. We want to do it the Italian way. Yeah. Agreed. So Agreed. Right. So every everybody who wants to teach a team hospitality needs to go to Italy. Maybe what's, that's what we should do. We should yeah. conduct a tour. Oh, Italy. yes. What did we learn? Yes. What oh. did we learn? Oh, I, take I'm in. <laughs> take my money. <laughs> so anytime, uh, talk to your accountant. Anytime you travel to Italy, you should write it off. Because it's all about learning about 
how to how to how to be nice and hospitable to people. Yeah, yeah. Our one of the reasons, you know, there was eight of us, four couples that went. And one of the reasons the um, the guy who set up everything for us uh, at the VRBO was the person who managed that house was a super host. And she she would book anything for you. So you just messaged her and she would have it done. So it wasn't just renting a space. We actually got service. We had hospitality. And she was like, oh, no, don't go there. You want to go here, right? So I'm curious. When you went into your VRBO. Yeah. Was there anything there? Custom? Yes. We walked into, is it focaccia bread? Am I saying it right? Focaccia. Yeah. It was amazing. And some cheese. And we were not the first ones there. So I'm trying to think, what did people eat before we got there? There might have been some other things there, I'm not sure. Uh, But no, it was, um, yeah, they had already laid out some warm focaccia bread for us and cheese. And it was delightful. Yeah, it was a great way to start because we kind of got there late. And then we went down for dinner after that. Of course, we're all exhausted, you know, from travel. But you're- You mean to tell me that no one gave you a clipboard with a piece of paper and said, here, fill this (laughs) out? Fill this out. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, isn't that weird, huh? No, it, it, the, the big objection is I want to provide all this customer care. I want to provide all this hospitality, but I'm shorthanded. Uh, we don't have time to do this. You know, time is money. So Dr. Goldberg, how do you overcome the shorthandedness in this world where we want to be providing more, more of an experience, more of our, we want to give more of ourselves to people. How do we overcome this? So it's the chicken and the egg. Yeah. Issue. Right. What do you do is, is you provide the hospitality first and then raise your prices or do you raise your prices first and then provide the hospitality? So the real the answer is you have to provide the hospital. You have to act. Yes. A certain way. That's right. Before and, and provide the value. Right. Because the mm-hmm. experience impacts value, the perception of yeah. value. So if you want to change your dependence on insurance, you have to focus more on people, provide that perception of better value. And then when you send out a notice that, you know what? We're changing our name and we're no longer going to accept insurance from this and this and this company. We're going to offer you a membership plan or whatever you know other incentives there are to stay, but because because they know that they will never experience the same value right. anywhere else, they will stay. Or as commonly happens, it happened in my practice when I did it. People left, mm, and, and then they, they came back. Yeah, and it's really important to make sure that the door is open for them to come back. Yeah, Always welcome back because people who leave may feel bad about coming back. Whoever's answering the phone. Um, I'd like my records transfer mm-hmm. has to be trained to make sure that they answer that phone call in a specific way. Yeah. You know, know how to handle it. Did, did we not, did we not fulfill your expectations? Mm-hmm. So you um, probably remember my, my, I married you for the money analogy when it comes to insurance, right? If, if your patient is marrying you for the money, meaning you're in my network, that's why I'm marrying you. And there's nothing else that changes that perspective. They're never going to fall in love with you. And so when you pull the money carpet out from underneath them, they're going to go somewhere else. But if they marry you for the money because of insurance, And then they come in and they have an experience and they actually fall in love with you because of who you are and how you operate. Then when you pull the carpet out and you do it the right way, you have conversations over six months and you communicate with them. You let them know how great it's going to be on the other side of this. They go, okay, I could handle this rocky part of the relationship. I'm willing to give you the benefit of the doubt because of how you treated me. And that takes that takes some effort ahead of time. You're going to feel the pain of being shorthanded, understaffed. You're going to feel a little drain at first. And that goes along with 2X growth or 10X growth, which is easier. And I don't know if you heard this guy talks about this sort of stuff, right? Um, and my wife loves it. She's, she's educating me on this. And 
this growth concept of saying, yeah, the reason you can't barely grow two times is because Dan, you're so Dan, 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 I'll look it up. Yeah. Look it up. Um, first uh, who, not, first who, then how, and then there's another one, no, Dan Sullivan. I'm sorry. Um, Dan Sullivan's uh, first who, then how, and then there's another one, you know, 10, about 10 X. Yeah. 10 X is easier than two X. How world-class entrepreneurs achieve more by doing less. Achieving 10 X growth is exponentially easier than striving for two times growth. Most find this confusing because you're thinking, Oh, I got to do two ten times more. What he, what he's saying is look, you're, you're too busy to be successful. Your busyness prevents successfulness and you got to learn how to, to kind of pull back the reins. And, and so for me and my business, that was, I need more of me. I need more coaches. I actually need to pour into coaches, not into clients. And so I had to remove client hours, remove client hours, which is scary and go, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get paid there, but I'm going to go pour into these people so that they can then grow, right? Scaling up. So it, it, it's, the book is, uh, it's on here now. If somebody wants to get it. It's a good book. According to my wife, Dan Sullivan. Oh, I, I, I actually listened to it. It's on yep. Audible and it's oh, actually I think, better to listen to it because in between chapters, there's conversations. Oh, nice. Aren't in the book. So audiobook is $0 right now. Free with your audible trial. <laughs> All right. Get so get it. So yeah, so yeah. So think about it this way. If you, let's say we're using the insurance free transformation concept here, you have to become something. You have to get out of your busyness mode and say, what's it going to be like when we're on the other side of this? We need to perform that way now. We need to be, we need to have hour long hygiene appointments. We need to have a new patient experience. We need to have a great call process on the phone. We need to have our practice perfect systems in place so that the experience when they come in is it's multipliable. Everybody can do it. Everybody has the same experience. Everybody's raving about it. All of those things come into play. Otherwise you're going to be stuck in this rut back to the dentist saying, I chose the wrong profession right? You, you, no, there's a great, this is a great profession to be in. You just got to find your vision and do it the right way and attach your trailer to the right rig. So as much as you want the experience to be the same, <laughs> you don't. Well, the you system do, is do. the same, but the disc, right. yeah, the adaptation right. of that so, person's experience so will be customized to them. Yes. I don't know if I, I told you the, the, <laughs> so I have a patient who comes in and he's the head of a hedge fund, mm -hmm. but he's a really nice guy. And I treated his mother and I treated his brother. Um, his brother is a New York Times bestselling author. His brother is one of the guys who mentored me in writing. Mm. Um, so anyway, Adam, um, <laughs> Adam comes in all the time and he takes his shoes off. Okay. In the dental office, he takes his shoes off. Yeah, okay. yeah. At the, when he gets in the chair, yeah. Takes oh, oh, got it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Takes his shoes off, and he looks at me, and he was a real joker, <laughs> oh, a kibitzer. And he, I said, he said, you know, it would be really nice if you had slippers here. Oh, nice. Okay, I thought he was gonna say foot massage, but yeah, okay. So, you know, every once in a while, we'll go to a fancy hotel, and you know, they have <laughs> slippers. Yeah. Brought one pair home. Yeah. And it's been sitting there in some, in a bag. Yeah. It never opened. Yeah. I made sure the next time he came in. Yeah. I took those slippers out of my closet and yeah. I brought them to the office. Yeah. And I said, here, here are your slippers. Yeah. And every time he came into the practice, whether it was in my operatory, it was an yeah. hygienist, Daniel, uh, Adam. His brother's Daniel. Adam had slippers. Yeah. So that's the that's the that's the that's the hot, hot dog hot dog example. The hot dog. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Customizing the experience it's, for the person, but the but system is different. the system is exceeding expectations. Correct. Yeah. And and listening. Mm. Yeah. Right. Because people won't tell you what their expectations are directly. Mm -hmm. Some people won't. Most people won't. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You have to intuit it some way. Re and, and that requires acute listening. You say, how do you do that? You have to make sure your radar is tuned to those opportunities. 
so that you're looking for ways to exceed expectations. That's right. Right. You're looking. I mean, if if <laughs> um, what is his name? Harvey McKay. So Harvey McKay is a sale does sales uh, talks. I don't even know if Harvey's around, um, but he sold he sold he sold um, letter uh, envelopes. Mm hmm of business he came up with a list when he made a sales call the people who arranged the sales call were responsible for finding out everything they possibly could about their client he was law of research yeah and he made sure that he had something that he could discuss that was relevant to what the, that person's experiences were so yeah. he knew they were a, a minnesota vikings fan yeah all yeah. right maybe he could arrange tickets to the game mm. right maybe he would give them some memento yeah um you know the principal cialdini's principle of reciprocity yes right? um if i'm going to give you something you'll do something nice for me yeah so how do you do that well, you do that by listening to what people are telling you and being interested, being genuinely interested in the person, not in, in their problem. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And being interested, not interesting. Back to some, just some simple principles. Yeah. He's got a lot of books. He, he let a book out in 2022. He's 90 years old now though. Woo. Yeah. He, he, he he's very, he's, very powerful speaker. A lot of books. Um, yeah, he's great. Seven I, New York Times bestsellers. Three number one bestsellers. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. So let's wrap up here with this. Transformation. It's continual. You might as well be on top of it. You might as well choose to be a part of it. You might as well seek it out. Why are, why are some younger 20 to 30 year olds smarter than some 60 year olds? Because they're actually looking for growth and transforming, well, right? I I think true transformational, mm -hmm. true transformation is not is not really continual. Has to be on purpose. It 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 if you want to really transform, there are a lot of things you have to change. So it's it's I mean, you you've seen companies will go like this. Yeah. You know, like this. Steve Jobs Steve Jobs didn't transform himself until he got fired from Apple. He got kicked out of his own company. Yeah. And it was that. There's the hero, heroes, right? The arc, right? Right. It was that, which was a transformation. So it would be nice to do it gradually. I don't think true transformation happens gradually. I think true transformation <laughs> happens with a, um, an event. It, a purposeful, it can be, it doesn't mm -hmm. have, you don't have to get fired. Mm -hmm. You don't have to lose $2 million. Yeah. But you can, but it needs to be planned. It needs to be organized. So and insurance it freedom. Based on, it needs to be based on the people that you have around you, the collaboration that you're going to need to en enact true transformation. Cause you know what, on ourselves, we can't do it ourselves, even on a personal basis. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to be it's, it's the people around you that you're I mean, connected look at, to. Look at a, look at a, 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 all right. They recognize that yeah. you can't do it alone. That's right. You yeah. need help. That's right. And that, so, and, that's and I guess what I was it. saying is when you're in that stories arc, the, the out part, I don't know that that ever ends. Because once you have that event, that change, you go, okay, I want to be insurance free, or I want to have whatever, you have to change who you are. And you're constantly growing and learning and deciding who you're going to be. There is no, oh, we did it. We're now completely transformed. There's always this steady increase of who you're now becoming. I agree. There's this moment in time where you go, okay, I need to transform. There's a moment in time of which that, that switches and then be on purpose about it. And it happens. Yes. Agreed. Okay. Good stuff. Love it. All right. Thanks again. We'll see you guys next month. Okie doke.